So now as we come to Judges, in the last few chapters, we've just seen uh, God raising up judges. And I want to just reiterate what we looked at last week, courageous women of faith. If you, did, if you were not here, I would say this for everyone, but certainly for the women who are here uh, especially. It was an exhortation for the men as well. They grabbed the CDs, they're back there. But courageous women of faith, and we saw that when the judges didn't stand up, when the men of God didn't stand up, that a woman of God had to stand up. And her name was? Deborah. Deborah. And Deborah stood up because the one who was called to lead refused. His name was Barak. Shocker. So, so Barak doesn't stand up, and Deborah does. And God begins to use her, and she's referred to as a judge or a prophetess. One of the few in the Bible, there's a few others, but the only time where we really see a God-ordained female leader, and again, God's highest, not that men are better or more gifted or more called, but God has a specific calling on men to be the spiritual leaders, and with that comes accountability. Amen? Amen? My wife says to me all the time, I'm glad you're called and you're accountable. Praise God for that. But the reality is that God has called the men to lead. And when men don't lead, women have to step up in the place. And, and again, that's what Deborah has done. And God begins to use her in a mighty way. And she doesn't refer to herself, we'll see in tonight's text, as the prophetess. She refers to herself as like the mother of Israel, overseeing them. So we saw last week that Israel's cycle of rebellion began again. Deborah again became the judge over Israel. And then we saw another woman used mightily by God who stood up when her husband wouldn't. Her name was Jael. We'll see her again tonight in tonight's text that she took a radical stand to make a stand for the things of God. Amen? And so tonight in Judges chapter 5, we're going to see that as we come to the text, we're going to see now that Deborah has a song that she sings. And this entire chapter is a song. And Deborah's going to sing this song in celebration of the victory that God gave them over the enemy. An enemy that outnumbered them. If you'll remember last week, an enemy that had 900 chariots. An enemy that was awe-inspiring in power. And now God has given them a miraculous victory. And now this is a praise song. And there's many things that music does that, you know, it's, here's the reality. You, and, and I hate to say this being a pastor, you, you, you forget messages all the time, but you remember songs. Can we say amen to that? And don't songs play on your emotion? And you'll hear a song from 30 years ago, and you're back at that spot. Isn't that true? Not just recently, I was in the mall, and I heard a song, a uh, lame song, Flock of Seagulls, I Ran, right? You guys remember that song? But I'm in the mall, and I hear it coming out of the mall, and it reminded me, when I played football in college, the guy who had the locker right next to me had that 8-track and played it, and it would just run over, and he had a boom box, there was no iPads boombox and he would crank that cd over and over and so i walked by and i could smell the grass stains on my football uniform hearing that mu and so god uses music amen and this song is going to be sung for generations to come and it's going to be a reminder to generations for generations to come of the power of god to give them victory if they will obey him amen so this is the song of deborah again written to commemorate what God had done, to be a constant reminder, not just to, de to that generation, but the generation to come, to stir up the old emotions. And again, I just love this picture, and I love her heart as we take a look at this song. Now, I tell the message tonight, if you have your outline, grab it, walking in victory. And as we look at Deborah's song, sung in celebration of glorious victory that God gave Israel, we're going to see clear applications for you and I today as we seek to live a victorious Christian life. As Christians, we don't fight for victory, we fight from victory. Amen? I've read the end of the book, God wins. Can we say amen to that? I was, you know, most of you know I have a full-time job. I was talking to a, one of our customer service reps today. I needed some help with a customer. When I called, I could tell immediately she was having a tough day. And I said, you having a bad day? She was, the last guy that called was a customer, and he was belligerent. And I said, hey, can I tell you some good news? 
I've read the book, and in the end, God wins. I had no idea if she was a Christian or not. And I said, you know, and it's called the Bible. It's a a bestseller. It's the best book ever. And she goes, amen to that. I believe that. I said, well, praise the Lord. We talked about the Lord for 20 minutes. And we were encouraging each other in our walk with God. And you know what? God brings those divine appointments, amen, and be reminded that God is faithful and God's in control and an upset customer ultimately. And I I shared with her, you know, we shouldn't be surprised when people who don't know God act like they don't know God. She goes, say that again. I'm going to write that down. (laughs) But we shouldn't be. Dogs bark and unsaved people act like they're not saved, amen? And Deborah is celebrating the victory, and we're going to be reminded of the power of God and the grace of God and all that God has done. And you know what, guys? May we ever be mindful of the God that we serve. As we seek to live a victorious Christian life, we need to remember the battle's already been won. He's not leaving it up to us because he's wise. (laughs) Amen? Because we would blow it. But it's good to know that the victory has been won. So let's take a look at the outline and we'll dig into the text. So I tell the message walking in victory. First, how do you and I walk? How do we have a victorious Christian walk? Why is it that some Christians you meet seem to have more joy? They seem to deal, great, deal well with difficult circumstances. It doesn't mean they don't have times of, of discouragement or maybe even depression for a moment. It doesn't mean those things don't happen, but there are those that you see and you think, man, why, are, you know, why do they handle this different than I do? And I want to give us some, some things that we see in the Song of Deborah that will be encouragement to us on how we can have a victorious Christian walk. First, by willingly responding to God's calling upon your life. Can I tell you, the people that are being used most by the Lord tend to be the ones going through the greatest trials, but also have the greatest amount of joy at the same time. Can we say amen to that? Show me somebody being used mightily, and I'll show you someone who's probably suffered greatly. And those who are being used mightily, even though they often suffer greatly, they also tend to be the ones that have the greatest amount of joy, because you know what? We were created to serve God. And when you're doing what you were created to do, it brings great joy to your life. Can we say amen to that? And the people that are, well, I don't know what my life's about. I don't even know why I'm here. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what to do. And, I, and you know what happens? There's, it's overwhelming all the time. And you know what? As Christians, we should not walk around looking like we've been sucking on a lemon. Amen? We have nothing to be bummed out about. Again, we can be heartbroken that somebody's lost. We can heart, be heartbroken about someone who's not walking with the Lord or someone who's ill. All of those things. But guys, we need to have an eternal perspective. So number one, by willingly responding to God's calling point in life. Number two, you walk in victory as you remember all that God has done for you. I've had, I don't know, half a dozen people in the last three days reach out to me by phone or text or whatever that are just beside themselves, totally bummed out and felt like God just forgot them. And I mean repeatedly. So that's something that happens in a lot of Christians' lives, maybe most Christians' lives sometimes. Can we say amen to that? It happens. And we go through it. But you know when we all, most often go through it? When we focus on the temporal and forget about the eternal. Can we say amen to that? And if we think back to, well, does God love me? Does God care about me? Is, is God, a, well, uh, yes, this much. Can we say amen to that? If we remember the cross of Calvary, if we remember all the things that God has done for us, if we remember that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, that we're going to heaven, that we're new creations in Christ, He's filled us with this Holy Spirit. Amen? Ephesians chapter 1, our riches in Christ. Blessed, chosen, adopted, accepted, redeemed, forgiven, enlightened, and assured. It's all in Ephesians chapter 1. Those are all promises of God that we have. And guys, we walk in victory when we remember all that God has done for us. Number three. By remembering who you were before you came to know Christ. People say often, you've heard me say it, being a Christian's hard. I reject that. Being an unbeliever is hard. Amen? Because the difference is we still may go through difficulty, but as a Christian, we don't go through it alone. As a Christian, we know that God will use it for his glory. That this is but light affliction when compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. That no suffering is wasted. If you don't know God, what is life about? I don't even know. And praise God. Remember who you were before you came to know Christ and recognize all that he's done for you. Amen? Fourthly, 
by boldly proclaiming what the Lord has done. So you remember it for yourself, now proclaim it to others. Amen? It's one thing just for me to remember, and it's another thing for me to tell somebody else. I'm talking on the phone with a lady in, in Debbie in Knoxville, Tennessee, one of our customer service reps who I've never met in my life, her company has thousands of people. We're talking about the Lord for 20 minutes, and by the end of it, she said, she said, now, Pastor Dave, when you call back, you make sure you ask for Debbie Watson, because I need a little, you know, Holy Spirit stuff a couple times a day. And you know, we got Jesus in common, we got everything in common, amen? I never even met her. We're like, you know, we're friends. I'm hugging her through the phone, you know? And guys, remember what God has done, but then share it with others. Because I just started sharing with her, and she happened to be a Christian, and I would have shared it either way. But I'm like, you know what this is called, Debbie? It's called a divine appointment. Amen? God let this account of mine be messed up so I'd have to call you so we could talk about Jesus. Amen? Guys, no suffering is wasted. Not only remember what God has done, but be faithful to share it with others. Number five, by walking in faithful and fearless obedience in the face of the enemy. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. And we have way too many people today who call themselves Christians, who water down the truth of the gospel, and are more afraid, of, are more worried about being popular with men than being faithful to God. Can we say amen to that? And it starts in the pulpits of America. It grieves me to see some of the stuff that happens and watering it down and we need to be more like the world. No, we need to be fearless for the Lord. Amen? Again, can't threaten me with heaven. What's the worst thing you could do to me? It's the best thing that could happen to me. Amen? Shoot me, I'll be in heaven. Let's bring it. Amen? And, and too often, we're just afraid of, I say anything, I'll be a Jesus freak, and I don't want that, and what if they have a question I don't have an answer to, and I don't, I'm going to look like an idiot, and he lives right next door to me, and he'll make fun of me, for, and the block party, they won't invite me anymore. Stop it, and just do it for the Lord. Quit worrying about everybody else. Be kind, be loving, be gracious, but be bold for the things of God. Amen? You've heard me say it. Enthusiasm is in theos, which means filled with God. You can't have enthusiasm if you're not filled with theos, filled with God. Amen? So as believers, there should be a level of enthusiasm because of who we are in Christ. Number six there, how do we walk in victory? By putting the flesh to death. Don't we have to kill the flesh every day? I was talking to a young man two hours ago, and I said, you are in a spiritual battle right now, young man. Here's the deal. The enemy wants to drag you away back to your old way of life, back to your old addiction. He wants to destroy you, and God is calling you unto himself. And you are in the middle of a spiritual battle, and you need to make a choice. Are you going to honor God, or are you going to continue on in the flesh? Because I'm telling you right now, if you continue on in the flesh, you will be miserable. Can we say amen to that? Sin is pleasurable for a season, but in the end, it leads to death. We need to put the flesh to death daily. Can I encourage you to wake up in the morning and say, Lord, help fill me afresh with your Holy Spirit, Help me to walk in the center of your will. And Lord, help me to die to my flesh today. Can we, that's a great prayer. Can we say amen to that? Number seven, by not falling for the false hope that the things of this world want you to trust in. We're going to see at the end of this that there's things that the world says, if you have this, then you'll be happy. Every infomercial has the answer. If you just had this Vegematic, your life would just be better than it's ever been. If you had this slow barbecue cooker that you can cook inside your house, life would be amazing. If you just came to my real estate seminar, you'll be a millionaire next week. And there's all these things that the world has to offer, and it's money, or it's physical pleasure, or it's a career, or it's a bigger house, or it's you know, a better, you know, being in better shape, or losing weight, whatever the thing is, but the flesh will never be satisfied, guys, amen? And the answers are not in what the world has to offer because this world is passing away. It's all going to burn and none of this is going to matter in the end. When this time has come and passed, only what we've done for Christ will last. And then finally, by entering into his rest. So let's begin there in verse 1. Deborah's going to start singing her song. We're going to see these uh, eight clear applications to each of our lives as we follow this song. It says there, 
in verse 1 of Judges 5. Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinam, sang on that day, saying. So what had just happened? God had just given them victory. So the victory has been won. You see the chariots, we'll see this later, all stuck in the mud. We'll see that God's given them this great victory. Sisera, the, you know, the general of the other army, is now dead, thanks to a woman who knew how to swing a hammer. We'll see that again, recounted. So the victory's been won, and because of the victory, they just start singing a song. They start praising the Lord. And you know what? I think that ought to be more evident in our lives today. Can we say amen to that? When we see what God is doing, it ought to cause us to worship Him. The car I own, I bought for well, a couple of reasons, but the main reason was the sound system. And I drive a lot. And last, you know, last Saturday, I drove six hours up to see my mom and six hours back. And I had six hours of worship music at the top of it, it was praising God at the top of my lungs, and six hours of praising God at the top of my lungs on the way back. And you know what? I'm like, man, this is good. Got 17 speakers piping in worship music. And I'm singing at the top of my lungs. I had the sunroof open, raising, you know. And, and you know what? When we walk with the Lord, shouldn't it? prompt us to praise? Is he worthy to be praised? What's the answer? And that's why Thursday nights are different. Some of you are coming from work. I don't get, especially Sunday morning, people dawdling in here. Worship is important. Can we say amen to that? It's one of the few things you do on earth you're going to do in heaven. Can we say amen to that? So, God brings a victory, and they can't help but start to worship him. And they're going to start singing this song. So after God had delivered Israel out of bondage yet again, had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan, Sisera, his general, and all of his mighty army, Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinam, sang on that day a song of glorious celebration for the great deliverance God had given them. Quickly, Deborah was the prophetess, one who spoke for God, a judge or deliverer. Again, when you think of judges, don't think of black robes and gavels. Think of a leader. Think of a prophet. Think of a spiritual leader, and God has used her. And she's a faithful and courageous woman who is willing to stand up when seemingly no man on the planet would. Who remembers what Deborah's name means? B, very good. Bonus points. She was much like a bee. As we saw last week, she was industrious. They flapped their wings 190 times per second. She was discerning. Bees can smell for five miles away. And she was sweet at the same time, but she had a sting when she needed it. Amen? And God was using Deborah because she made herself available when nobody else would. It says in 2 Chronicles, the eyes of the Lord search to and fro among the whole earth, seeking one he can show himself strong on account of one whose heart is loyal to him. God's not looking for a better message or a better method. He's just looking for men and women who will say, I'm here, use me. And Deborah was that woman. When no man would step up, she did. Now, Barak, his name means lightning, but he didn't quite live up to his name. He was the reluctant Jewish general uh, who wouldn't go out into battle unless Deborah went with him. Well, if you'll go, I'll go. I know we're supposed to fight a battle, and I'm the general, but I'll go if you'll go. If you'll go, I'll go. Wimp. <laughs> Amen? Really? You'll only go if your mama goes, you know, if a woman... T Come on, man. Man up! If God is for us, who can be against us? Amen? Here's the problem with Barak. He didn't have faith. He only had faith in Deborah's faith. Amen? Don't put your faith in someone else's faith. You have your own faith. Can we say amen to that? Well, pastor, if you pray, then maybe God will hear do you know it's the same Holy Spirit lives in you that lives in me? Well, Billy Graham prayed it, then they would really... No. Guys, we don't put our faith in men, we put our faith in Christ. Can we say amen to that? And we don't want to trust in, well, I just put, if that person was there, if they would just, if so-and-so would just get saved, wouldn't it be amazing? God doesn't need any of us. Amen? Let me ask you a question. Here's a quick analogy on faith. Would you rather go, well, let's, or, or, you know, would you rather go to Fiji and then come and enjoy it for three weeks or send me and then let me tell you about it? 
And a lot of people, that's their faith. I go hang out with the Lord and then they just want me to come tell them about it. Guys, don't let me tell you about it. You go hang out with him yourself. Amen. Can we say amen to that? Barack's like, well, if you'll go, then I'll go because you've got faith. And I think if, I'm, if you're there, we might be okay. Let's get beyond that. Now, I'm not saying we don't reach out to other faithful people in a time of trial. I'm not saying there aren't times when we say, Lord, I, you know, I need prayer. Can you pray for me? That's all valid. That's all biblical. But guys, we need to have our own faith that doesn't just rest on the faith of somebody else. He relied on her faith. Now, I want you to notice this. He said he would only go if Deborah went. And what did Deborah do? She went. So ladies, if you've got a faithless husband who needs you to go with him, go with him. Amen? If he's, well, I'll go to church. If you go to, let's go. Amen? And then let me know and I'll tell, man up! But, <laughs> but I'm saying, that you know what I mean? Because what happen often is when a man doesn't lead, a lot of times a woman will just give up. Or if the man needs to be encouraged, she'll look down on him. Encourage your husband. Amen? Walk with him as he, maybe he's not as faithful as he should be, but pray that he becomes more faithful. So they sang on that day, the, great of their vic the, the day of their great victory. And here's what they sang. Here's what they sang. This is a song. When leaders lead in Israel, when the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. I like that. When the leaders lead. God has a calling upon our lives. When do we walk in victory? By willingly responding to God's calling upon our lives. When the leaders lead, bless the Lord. When people willingly step out and serve God, bless the Lord. Guys, you've got a calling, I've got a calling, your calling's different than mine, and you know what? May I use what God's called me to do to bless you, and may you use what God's called you to do to bless me. Can we say amen to that? And may we use our gifting, all of them, above all else, to bless the Lord. Amen? Because that's why we live and move and breathe. And guys, the body of Christ has a greater impact on the world around it when we quit being pew potatoes and we quit sitting on our hands and we quit being spectators and we start serving the Lord. Amen? Now, it's pretty amazing. I, I've, I think we've had more visitors in the last month to this church than we had in the five months before. You know why? People are inviting people. Isn't that amazing how that works? Hey! What are you doing on Sunday? Hey, you know, people all, you know, they don't even know the church is there. Invite them. And I'm not trying to build Calvary Chapel. I want to build the kingdom of God. Can we say amen to that? And when we step out of our comfort zone and, you know, and when we do that, God shows up, doesn't he? And she's literally singing the song, when the leaders lead. When the leaders lead. When the people willingly offer themselves. Guys, we're all called to lead. Did you know that? If you're a husband, you're called to lead your wife. If you're parents, you're called to lead your children. If you're a teacher in a school, like several people in this room, you're called to lead your students. If you own a business, you're called to lead your employees. Can we say amen to that? Uh, each one of us, we have people in our life that God's called us to, to lead them, to be an example to them, for them to follow. And I have found that virtually all of us are called both to lead but also to follow. Just like we're all called to lead in certain areas of life, we're also called to follow in certain areas of life. And here's what I found. Those who are not willing to follow make horrible leaders. Can we say amen to that? The Bible says you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the, the servant of all. Who is the greatest servant who ever lived? And who is the greatest person who ever lived? Guys, we need to learn to, to lead, but it begins by learning to follow. And she says, and I love that song, the pe when people willingly offer themselves. Again, it's tragic when those who are called to lead won't step up. And I think that's a, one of the biggest problems we've got in our country today, in our world today. People called to lead. Do you think that one of the major problems we have in America today is absentee fathers? Can we say amen to that? I think it's a, one of the greatest problems we have. And what we need even more than just dads being there, we need godly dads to be there. Amen. That changes everything. Can we say amen to that? And when they don't willingly step up, and they don't willingly serve, and they don't willingly leave, it's tragic. 
It's just as tragic when those who are called to follow and submit won't do that either. Guys, we saw it in Romans 13, we're to submit to the authority God's placed over us. Guys, whether it's to lead or to follow, the key to walking in victory is the willingness to respond to God's calling upon your life. God brought victory to Israel as the leaders stood up and, uh, to lead at God's command and people willingly followed and joined in the battle. Victory came with willingness, a willingness to be used by God, whatever he may choose. By the way, willingness to choose doesn't mean we put conditions on God. God, I'll serve you if I get to do what I want. God, I'll serve you if it's somewhere with palm trees, unless you're Jack and that's what you don't want. God, I'll serve you if it's in the right place at the right time, if it's what I want to do, if I can be comfortable, then I'll serve you. Guys, you know when we surrender our lives to God, we lay our lives at his feet and say, God, if you want me mopping floors in China, sign me up. Amen? It's a full surrender to God. By the way, whatever he calls you to do, he's going to give you a joy doing it. Amen? Whatever it is. It'll be a get to, not a have to. It'll be a blessing. Bless the Lord. While we respond, it's God who does the good, who does the work, and God alone is one who should be glorified. She said, hey, when leaders lead, praise God. Amen? When people follow, praise God. He didn't say when leaders lead, praise leaders. He didn't say when people follow, praise followers. He said when that happens, praise God. Guys, this is not the me church. This is the he church. Not about me, it's about he, amen? And to him be all the glory and all the praise and all the honor. So point number one, walking in victory by willing responding to God's calling upon your life. Don't be content sitting on the sideline. Verses three through five, as you remember what God has done for you. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes. I even I will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, and the earth trembled, and the heavens poured, and the clouds also poured water, and the mountains gushed before the Lord, the Sinai before the Lord God of Israel. Man, I could just hear them singing it. And they're praising God, and now we have the understanding of how they had the victory. Some of you asked last week, how did I know there was rain that clogged up all the chariots? There's the verses right there. They went out to fight. The chariots were like having 900 tanks against a bunch of guys who didn't even have guns, equivalent. And they had siths that went out 15 feet on each side, right at knee level. And they would charge those chariots and cut people down at the knees. Here they are going out against this great and mighty army because God told them to go. And they look at it from a physical perspective and it looks like there's no way there's going to be victory. And then God did something as simple as make it rain. And then those chariots became boat anchors stuck in the mud. And the mighty battle was won and God was glorified. If they had had equal armies, they could have taken the credit. If they had had just as many chariots or... If they had a bunch of 12-foot-tall warriors who are mighty and trained who went out, and, then they could take the credit. God often puts us in a place where we are so overmatched that when the victory comes, only God can get the glory. And praise God for that. Can we say amen to that? It's one of the reasons I wanted to plant a church in Calabasas. Two churches in this whole city were the third Calvary Chapel to come here. It's 70% Jewish and a lot of people so wealthy they don't think they need God. Isn't that the best place to take a halogen light, the darkest place around? And if God does something, and God's already done something here. A lot of people have gotten saved here. And guess who gets all the glory? Can we say amen to that? To God be all the glory and all the praise and all the honor. And he's crying, they're crying out to the kings. Deborah desires and wishes that all the world's leaders would hear the wonderful works of God that he did for his people. And I love her boldness. I, even I, will sing. I love her humility that she gives the praise and the glory. She's bold and humble at the same time. Did you know that both of those can be true? You can be bold to speak up and humble enough to give God all the glory. Amen? Not to point people to yourself, but only to point people to him. And again, it's written in a sense of though not the most gifted with the ability to sing, she sang unto the Lord. By the way, I've had people say to me over the years, I've been a pastor for 30 years, yeah, I don't sing during worship because I don't have a very good voice. Let me encourage you. Who are you singing to? If you're singing to the person next to you, you've missed it. And God loves your voice. 
It's a joyful noise to him. Emphasis on noise for some of us. Amen? <laughs> but it's joyful to the Lord. And guys, if we're singing to God, then it doesn't matter how I sound to people. Can we say amen to that? And it's almost the inference here of Deborah is, I sing even though people, I'm going to sing anyway. Because I love the Lord. And I'm unashamed of him. In light of all he's done, she wasn't going to let something as insignificant as a poor voice get in the way. And so too may you and I never allow our perceived physical weakness or fear to keep us from what God has for us. She then reminds him, Lord, when you went out from Seir, God won the victory uh, for Israel over Sisera by sending the great rain. And in the song, Deborah recalled a time when God did the same thing on behalf of the children of Israel in the days of, ex uh, days of the Exodus. You know what? This song will be sung generations later, and as the song's being sung, people will be reminded of the power of God to show up when they're outnumbered. They would be reminded, you know, they were reminded of the Red Sea. They were reminded of the Exodus. They're reminded now of what God has done. And it's good for us to remind. Because you know what happens? People are, we have a generation right now that has very little belief in God because they've been taught a lie and brainwashed with lies and taught the, the fallacy of things like evolution and all kinds of nonsense that attacks the true and living God. And those of us who love God aren't loud enough about telling the truth. Can we say amen to that? We can't blame the world for teaching a lie. That's what they do. But we can put it on us that we need to be more outspoken about our faith. Amen? People don't like it when you tell them evolution's nonsense. And then when you start making sense, it's an opportunity to point them to the Lord. God showed his power when he gave them the law at Sinai. He spoke and they all trembled. Remember that? To the point where they said, Moses, you go talk to him. We can't be around him. The song is being sung to remind them of the power of God and all that God has done. Guys, it's good to be reminded again and again. You know, in the Old Testament, it was uh, the enemies God defeated, the Egyptians, the Canaanites, the power he showed it in the plagues, the parting of the Red Sea. Did he spoke from, from Sinai, the manna, the water from the rock. What is the greatest thing that we should always be reminded of when we think of what God has done for us? What should always come to mind? What is it? Salvation, Salvation at the cross. It's the cross. Amen? Why do cities spend tens of thousands of dollars suing to get a cross taken down? Because the cross of Christ is a stone of offense. It's a stumbling block. Amen? See, the place where you get saved or brings conviction upon your heart. And so they're just going to, they're singing a song and celebrating all that God has done. So walk in victory by willingly responding to God's calling upon your life as you remember all that God has done for you. And then by remembering who you were before you came to know Christ. Think of verse 6. In the days of Shag Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were deserted. And all the travels were walking alone in the byways. Village life ceased. It ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose a mother in Israel. Now, she's reminding them before God raised up Deborah that they were so fearful that they would not even walk on the main roads. We're going to see there were archers that would pick them off like snipers as they walked along the road. They were in bondage to the world. They were afraid of the world. They were fearful for their lives. They had no peace whatsoever. And then God used a woman to stand up because no man would. And she saw herself as a mother to the children of Israel. She saw them. It broke her heart. And because no one else would stand up, she stood up. And she's reminding them of how things were before God showed up. Amen? Look, I'm a Christian before I'm anything and it's not even close. But I'm an American and I'm proud to be an American. I know people shake at that, really. I hate America. I love my country. I love Jesus way more. But I love my country. Amen? And one of the many things I love about our country is that we have the freedom to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can we say amen to that? And we're living in a world right now where our country is being bashed and people live here and say America is no good. Let me just tell you right now, America was at its greatest when America was at its godliest. 
And when they tried to come over and find out why America was great, they went into the government halls and they didn't find it there. They went into the city squares and they didn't find it there. Went into the churches and that's where they found it. Amen? This country was founded on the Lord. Jesus Christ, do you know Harvard and all the universities began as seminaries? Do you know that Jesus Christ was the focus of this country and God blessed it? And the man who came and found all this out went back and said, America is great because America fears God and America will cease to be great when America ceases to fear God. And the exhortation here is she's reminding them of where they were before God showed up. And guys, we need to be reminded of that. Can you say amen? In our own individual lives, in the lives of this country. So Deborah's recalling a time when God did the same thing on behalf of Israel and he had brought such great victory and now she's singing to remind them. Uh, Sh Shamgar, the previous judge, the highways were deserted. People lived in constant fear of the enemies. They took back roads to avoid being attacked. Village life ceased. Fear crippled them. They could no longer dwell in the unwalled villages out of fear of attack. They lived in fortified cities for security. And then God raised up a godly judge. Why? Because she was available and she was willing. Again, she refers to herself there as a mother in Israel. She doesn't say a prophetess, a judge, a warrior, a counselor, a leader, a songwriter. She saw herself simply as a mom. And too often we think we need somebody of great stature and great title. And what we simply need is men and women who will say, Lord, I'm here, use me. Amen? Lord, take what little I have and use me. You plus God is a majority. Amen? Some of you might be thinking, what's your ministry? Uh, it begins with raising godly kids. But uh, guys, it also, if you're, again, if you're not a mom or a dad, God has put people in your life that he wants you to lead and guide and direct and pour your life into. And Deborah, not the prophet, not the judge, but simply referred to herself in a simple way as somebody being used mightily by God. She says there, in verse 8, they chose new gods, and then there was war in the gates. Not a shield or a spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. You know what's amazing here? There were 40,000 soldiers, they didn't have one sword or spear among them, and they were fighting 900 people with chariots. And everybody with swords and spears. That's overwhelming. Amen? Do you ever feel overwhelmed as a Christian in our country? Do you ever feel in California? You ever feel overwhelmed and outnumbered? Again, if God is for us, who can be against us? Can we say amen to that? Our God is a powerful God, an all-knowing God, an almighty God. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Not a shield, not a spear. But notice that they were in trouble because they had turned to other gods. Israel was serving false gods, living in fear, under constant attack. You know what? If you're not walking with the Lord, you should be afraid. Can you say amen to that? Again, another young man talking to him this week. Why is God allowing this to happen? Nobody that's here. Well, it's one of my sons, okay? And he's like, Dad, why is God allowing this to happen? I said, because, son, you're living in open rebellion against God, and God's not going to bless your rebellion. It's just that simple. Amen? It's not always a great message to deliver or, or an easy message to hear, but it's the right one. Amen? You can't shake your fist at God and then want him to bless you. You can't abort babies, use his name more as a curse word than anything else, and then sing God bless America at a baseball game and expect God to bless our country. Amen? We're going to stop shaking our fists at God. If we're going to kneel for anything, we've got to kneel for the cross of Calvary. Can we say amen to that? So, number three, by remembering who you were before you came to know Christ. They were running in fear. The enemy was coming upon them. They were overwhelmed. Point number four, by boldly proclaiming what the Lord has done. Verse nine, my heart is with the rulers of Israel who offered themselves willingly with the people. Bless the Lord. We heard that before. She's singing it again. Speak to you who ride on white donkeys. What in the world does that mean? White donkeys were rare and highly, highly prized, and they were only owned by the wealthy or those great in stature. 
And she's saying here, speak you who ride on white donkeys. Speak you who are in positions of authority. Speak you who have positions of power and where have been blessed by God. You need to speak up for the things of God. Don't keep it to yourselves. Then it says, who sit in judges attire and who walk along the road, who exercise authority in Israel, who no longer walk in fear of the attacks. Those, everyone else is hiding. Those who are bold and willing to stand up, they need to not just stand up, they need to speak up. Amen? And that's what she's saying here, is, as she's singing. And then it says there right below that, far from the noise of the archers among the watering places, there they shall recount the righteous acts of the Lord, the righteous acts for his villagers in Israel. Again, she's boldly proclaiming the things that God has done. Where snipers once picked them off when they went to retrieve, retrieve water, uh, they now can walk along the road in peace and sing the praises of God. A place where they once walked in fear, now they can walk and openly sing the praises of God. She's letting them know the things that God has done. Then it says there, then the people of the Lord, it says, and the righteous acts of villagers of Israel, then the people of the Lord shall go down to the gates, sharing the great things of God wherever they go, among the villagers, the poor in the watering houses, as well as the more wealthy who sit within the gates. Those who sit within the gates usually are people of political power, and even them, they would go and proclaim openly and boldly to them the truth of who God is and what God had done. Verse 12, awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, sing a song. Arise, Barak, lead your captives away, O son of Abinoam. Song here sings of a call to action. Deborah, sing, Barak, enter into the battle. The exhortation to boldly fulfill God's calling upon their lives. I love this picture. You know what? Awake, awake. I think we need to sing that to the church today. Can we say amen to that? Time to wake up. Time to get out of the comfort zone. Time to be unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's sad that we're shocked when we hear Jesus' name on TV these days. Can we say amen to that? I'll get a text. Did you see somebody mention Jesus at the Super Bowl? I, I videotaped it. You want me to send it to you? Guys, that should be the rule, not the exception. Can we say amen to that? So point number five in walking in victory. By walking in faithful and fearless obedience in the face of the enemy. Look at verse 13. Then the survivors came down, the people against the nobles, so the remnant. The Lord came down for me against the mighty. For, from Ephraim were those whose roots were in Amalek. After you, Benjamin, with your peoples. From Mature, rulers came down. And from Zebulun, those who bear the recruiter's staff. And the princes of Issachar with, were with Deborah. As, so Issachar, as Issachar, so was Barak, sent into the valley under his command. Under the divisions of Reuben, there were great resolves of heart. What's interesting there is he mentions most of the tribes of Israel, doesn't he? And what he's saying is, even though idolatry had begun to reign, even though they had turned their backs on God, God brought a revival in the remnant that was still wanted to worship the Lord. You know, the reason that God continues to bless our country is there's a remnant of people here that still love him. Can we say amen to that? I went as far as to tell the CEO of our company, he took me out to breakfast when he, our companies merged about six months ago, and I said, and he said to me, what? he asked me, you know, talk about divine appointments. He goes, you know, you've been with the company 30 years, you're very successful. Can you explain to me why you're so successful? Let me tell you. <laughs> and we talked about the Lord. And I said, you know what? If, we do, if I do my job as unto the Lord, if I honor God and all that I do, God's going to bless it. And I said, one of the reasons God's blessed this company so, well, so much, there's a lot of Christians in this company. He goes, you really believe that? I said, there's not a doubt in my mind. When I was in San Jose, every time they had a job opening, they'd come and ask me, is there anybody in your church looking for a job? Because we need more people like the rest of the Christians in this office. They show up on time. They work hard. They don't steal. They do the right thing. They honor the Lord. You know what? The remnant that was left within Israel, God's going to stir them up, and God's going to use them. And guess what? That's a picture of what's coming in Israel too. Amen? During the great tribulation, there's going to be a great revival that comes amongst the Jewish people. So the remnant, once under the yoke of Jabin, had dominion over the powerful, and the Lord came down for me against the mighty. Though God used Deborah in the victory, she gives God all the glory. Amen? 
Notice she says the Lord came down. She didn't say, well, then I came down and rescued you bunch of lazy people. That's not what happened. She instead gives God all the glory. So Ephraim, Deborah's own tribe, Benjamin, Mature was the, the, the Manassites that were actually on the west side of the Jordan, on the right side of the Jordan. Zebulun uh, dropped their pens, took the sword, and went after them. Issachar, uh, from the tribe of Issachar, came both Deborah and Barak. From Reuben, uh, again, they thought about entering the battle, and, and then they did nothing. Uh, paralysis of analysis. This is a lot, of, a lot of the church today. Look at verse 16. It says, Why did you sit among the sheepfolds to hear the pipings from the flocks? The divisions of Reuben have great searchings of heart. You know what they did? They sat among the sheepfold. They were hanging out with the sheep. But they weren't reaching the world. Do you see that? We're the sheep. Amen? And there's some people that the only time they act like a Christian is when they're hanging out with the sheep. Because that's when it's easiest. Can we say amen to that? It's easy to walk in here and say, praise the Lord, God bless you, brother, you know, and, and then walk outside and be afraid to talk about the Lord. And he's, he's exhorting Reuben that you guys, you know, you're hanging out amongst the sheep, but you're not stepping out in faith to reach a lost and a dying world. Amen? And guys, if Monday doesn't change, Sunday doesn't count. Amen? There needs to be a change. We need to live different. And here's this exhortation. And sadly, you know, Reuben settled on the other side of the Jordan. He settled where it was easy. And I think this is a picture of too much of the church today, just taking the easy path, the easy way, not wanting to get out of their comfort zone. Oh, I got the get out of hell free card. I'm good. I've had people say, well, I'm, I, I've been thinking about getting involved in ministry since 1965. <laughs> You know, the analysis, the paralysis of analysis. I've been thinking about it. Dig a well, water might spring up, amen? Just step out, it's okay. I'd rather be sloppy and mess up than do nothing. Can you say amen to that? Let's try it. Let's step out for the kingdom of God, for the cause of Christ. It's time to stop thinking and time to start doing, amen? Verse 17, Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. And why did Dan remain on ships and Asher continued at the seashore? Uh-oh, here we go. So the battle's raging and Dan is on a cruise ship and Asher's hanging out in the surf. <laughs> Maybe the waves are big. I know there's a battle, but man, big swell. <laughs> Hope the war's still going on later, man, but I've got to get the tasty waves while I can. Dan's on a cruise ship. They're on boats. The war's over there. Hey, there's a war over there. Hey, uh, they got that chocolate, you know, fountain going right now. They got the 24-hour dessert thing going on. Is there a comedian we can go listen to? You know, it's sad when the war's over there and people are hanging out where it's safe. And I want to tell you something. I think, I can't imagine, there's, there's nothing sadder than to have a saved soul and a wasted life. Amen? To be born again, going to heaven, but having no impact on eternity. And I'll tell you what, I just, there's just no peace in that. Then it says there in verse 18, Zebulun, they stayed by his inlets. It said, Zebulun is a people who jeopardized their lives to the point of death. Naphtali also on the heights of the battlefield. So you got guys on a cruise ship. You got guys surfing, hanging out at the beach. And then you got people that are going out risking their lives for the kingdom of God. Let me ask you a question. Those in heaven right now, which one of those do you think uh, is more blessed that they did what they did? Those who said, let's go for it for the Lord. I want to tell you something. When I, when I would go to India, I learned a whole new level of fearlessness. I used to think I was pretty fearless, and then I met those guys. And I would teach up to 1,000 pastors for 12 hours from 6 in the morning till 6 at night. And then we would leave, and we'd get in a couple Jeeps, and one of those pastors would take us out to these villages out in the middle of nowhere. Most of them had no electricity. And you'd go into this village, and they had been telling people for six months that a pastor was coming. And they would have all this big crowd of people, and we'd bring a generator, and we'd throw a light over, and I'd get up with a microphone and start preaching Jesus, and this guy was my interpreter. He'd been in prison multiple times for his faith. 
And one of the times we were there, all of a sudden it was a very rural village, and we looked up and there were guys with loincloths and spears. And they weren't happy we were there. And there's only one white guy there, <laughs> kind of standing out. So the guys with the spears are getting all animated, and the guys, I said, it, and we're preaching Jesus to this crowd of people, and they're getting closer, and they're getting fired up, and, you know, I'm getting ready to get the Saul treatment like David had, ducking from spears. And I'm looking over at him, he's like, just keep going, bro. Just keep going, bro, don't worry about it. I said, they're not going to throw the spears? Goes, they do sometimes. <laughs> it's okay, man. God's in control, right? God's in control, right? Yeah, God's in control. Dude. <laughs> Amen? Then you come back. I, I, said, I, I, I prayed at my meal in a restaurant. I'm bold. You know what I mean? This guy's standing there with people with spears getting ready to strike him down. Lord, give us peace to rest in you and not to fear men no matter what. Amen? To be like Zebulun and Naphtali says, we're going to go fight the battle because this battle belongs to the Lord. He's already going to bring the victory. And even if they take my life, I'll close my eyes on earth and I'll open them up in glory. Church today needs some people who are willing to die for the cause of Christ. Amen? Others are so unwilling to leave their comfort zone, they won't come to church when it's raining. Amen? Yeah, I'm sorry, Pastor, we missed church last month, but it was sprinkling like three of those weeks. So, just washed my car. It was in the garage. And I didn't want to. You know, guys, really? I'm talking to you guys. You're here on Thursday night. I'm not talking to you about you. Verse 19 to 20. I believe i got to pick it up. It says there, the kings came and fought. Then the kings of Canaan fought in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. They took no spoils of silver. Megiddo, remember that's Har Megiddo, where we get Armageddon. Israelite people who fought didn't do it to become wealthy. They did it because God called them. Notice it says they didn't take the spoils. They weren't after the silver. They didn't go fight the battle so they'd get rich. Uh, there's a few people in Christ Christianity that should hear that. Amen? They weren't in it for money. They were in it for the Lord. Anybody who's in it for the money is not in it for the Lord. Can we say amen to that? And it says they weren't after the spoils. They weren't chasing after any of it. Uh, Jabin had, again, Canaanite other Canaanite reinforcements. They came after them. Verse 20. They fought from the heavens. The stars from their courses fought against Sisera. Remember, Sisera is the general. It says there the torrent of Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent of Kishon. Oh, my soul, march on in strength. Then the horse's hooves pounded, the galloping, the galloping of his steeds. Curse, morose, said the angel of the Lord. Curse its inhabitants bitterly, because they do not come to help the Lord, to help the Lord against the mighty. It says the heavens opened up. What did the heavens do? I don't know. I, I, I'm assuming it's rain. It says the stars shone. How did God use the stars in the battle? I don't know for sure, but he did, and he can. Can we say amen to that? So the stars and the sky opens up. The battle belongs to the Lord. When it says curse Miraz, that's uh, on the hand was cursed by, you know, cursed by God, the Israelite city that chose not to get involved. They were sitting there like Dan on the cruise ship and Asher in the ocean, and they wouldn't get involved. They let someone else be the one to go share their faith. Someone else invite somebody to church. Somebody else serve in the children's ministry. Somebody else be involved in the things of God. Somebody else go on a missions trip. Don't ask me to do anything. And they said on the side, and notice who it says, cursed them, the angel of the Lord. Who's the angel of the Lord? It's Jesus. Every time you see the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, it's pre-incarnate Jesus Christ who showed up to exhort them because they were sitting on the sideline when his children were out to battle. I think if he were in the United States, he'd be exhorting us. Can we say amen to that? The horses were coming. They heard the, you know, the hooves coming. And when they heard all of it, God showed up in a mighty and a powerful way. You know, sometimes we have to wait till we hear the horses coming before God shows up. Can we say amen to that? You know, Lord, if I had known six months ago you were going to show up, I wouldn't be so worried right now. 
And sometimes we get in a place, I've shared that story, where we had no food left in the house when I was a preacher's kid as a young man, and there was, seven, there was like six days left in the month, and we went to church, and we came home. There was one box of mac and cheese, and, I was gonna, and we we're going to just have to figure it out after that. We come home and open up the cupboard, and food falls out, and the fridge is full of food, and there were otter pops in the freezer. I'll never forget it. When you're six, that's what you remember, right? But somebody had been moved by the Holy Spirit and showed up. And you know, if they'd showed up two weeks earlier, I wouldn't be talking about it 50 years later. Amen? God shows up right on time. And that's exactly what happens here. They have to come to the end of themselves. They have to be in a place of desperation. Sometimes you wonder, why am I in a place of desperation? So we can see God move. Amen? One day soon the battle will be over and it's going to be too late. Use your gifts. Use your talents now while you can. Use them now. So point number six, by putting the flesh to death. How do we walk in victory? <laughs> Most blessed among women is Jael. Now some of you thought last week when she, you know, did the tent peg, <laughs> you might have wondered, is she blessed? Did she mess up? Did she blow it? Well, we got our answer. Most blessed among women is Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, Blessed is she among women in tents. <laughs> she took that gifting that she had and used it in a whole new way. Heber means crossed over. It's where, it's where you get the word Hebrew. But he, Heber wouldn't step up. If you remember what Heber did, he actually told the enemy that the children of Israel were mounting up. You remember that? So he betrayed his people. So just like Deborah stood up when no man would stand up, so Jael is going to stand up to, the, to Sisera, one of the generals of the enemy, because her husband had turned his back on God. So she's going to stand up when he won't. And it says she's blessed among women, and it tells the story again. By the way, this is in the song. They're singing this. But it says in verse 25, he asked for water, she gave him milk. She brought out cream in a lordly bowl. Remember that we know from the precepts he came into the tent, he was hiding because all the chariots had been stuck. The children of Israel were overrunning them. He's running for his life. He knows that Heber had given him information. He thinks this is a friendly tent. He runs into this all black tent. It's, uh, you know, it's hot out in the sun. He runs into this black tent, and there is Jael, Heber's wife, and she says, come hide over here. Let me cover you up with some blankets when it's 120. <laughs> oh, you want some water? Here's some cream. Here's some milk. Have some warm milk and a blanket in 120 degree heat. And in he comes, and quite quickly, he's out. He's taken a nap. She covered him. Sister was tired and thirsty. He asked for water. Jael's name means mountain goat, and she gives him some warm milk instead in that Middle Eastern tent. And again, it's a compromise to remain neutral, and she's going to make sure that her family's not neutral anymore. Can we say amen to that? Verse 26. So she stretched out her hand to the tent peg, her right hand to the workman's hammer. She pounded Sisera. She pierced his head. She split and struck through his temple. At her feet he sank, he fell, he lay still. At her feet he sank, he fell. Where he sank, there he fell, dead. <laughs> you know, it doesn't have like the, and I'm not a, a lyricist, but this almost sounds like this could be the chorus of the song. Right? At her feet he sank, he fell, he laid at, you know. <laughs> Can't you just see it? She's bringing tambourines at his feet. She drove a tent peg through his temple. He fell dead. <laughs> so he died. I guess so. I'm thinking temp, tent peg through the temple, that'd probably do it. Amen? But she fulfilled Deborah's prophecy from verse 9 of chapter when it said that at the hand of a woman that Cicero would, would die. Remember that? It wasn't Deborah, though. It was Jael. You know, in contrast to those walking in victory or those who have false hope in something or someone else, 
And they're dead and they don't even know it. You know, this guy was dead when he walked in the tent and he didn't even know it. He was laying there having drank the hot milk and was completely out of it. And he was dead and didn't even know it. It was coming for him. And it was coming for him because he was shaking his fist at Almighty God. Point seven, how do we walk in victory? By not falling for false hope that the things, uh, the things of this world want you to trust in. Look at verse 28 through 30. It says there, the mother of Sisera looked through the window and cried out through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarries the clatter of his chariots? Her wisest, wisest ladies answered, yes, she answered herself. Are they not finding and dividing the spoil to every man a girl or two? For Sisera, plunder of the dyed garments, plunder of the garments embroidered and dyed, two pieces of dyed embroiders for the neck of the looter. So Sisera's mom is wondering why he hasn't returned from battle. And the women begin to sing that it's because he's had such a great victory that he's dividing up the spoils and he'll be home soon with some slave girls and some, you know, new tapestries and some gold and silver. He's going to come back rich with a few more women on his side. And isn't it interesting that there's nothing new under the sun because the Muslims who flew into the Twin Towers thought they were going to have 70 virgins waiting for him on the other side of the victory. And a half a second after they hit the Twin Towers, they found out not so much. And guys, when the world is looking for an answer, if they look anywhere else but to Jesus, what they're really looking at is something that will never happen, that will never satisfy, that will never bring them joy. And she thought he was going to come home in victory any moment, and she's going to find out that he's dead. And guys, the people that live in this world right now, it breaks my heart more and more all the time. It's hard for me to watch almost anything. I love sports and I'm pretty safe there. But oh, it's hard to watch a lot of other stuff because the world is so full of itself. Can you say amen to that? It's so nauseating how everybody, you know how great I am? Let me tell you how great I am. Let me tell you about my greatness and let me just tell you more about my greatness and talk about me some more. I'll tell you about the movie I made. A guy told, wrote stuff down for me to go over there and stand and say what he told me to say, but I'm great. <laughs> stand there, say that, say it. Here's a trophy. Pat yourself. And we live in a world that's so full of itself. If we didn't die to self and esteem him, amen? You know what? I'll go to the award show when you speak stars into the sky. Give me a call. <laughs> amen? When you start raising people from the dead, call me up. I'll, I'll, I'll join you. Amen? There's a, there's a day coming when we're going to rule and reign with the Lord for a thousand years. Amen? I can't wait. They're looking for their son to come home. They think he's invincible. His army's too great. And they didn't realize that he was dead. And here's the reality. No matter how much the world accumulates, they think they're invisible. But without Jesus, they have nothing. And we need to pray for him. And we need to love him in Jesus' name. Amen? And then finally, how do we walk in victory? By entering into his rest. Look at the last verse. Thus, let all your enemies perish, O Lord, but let those who love him be like the sun when it comes out in full strength. So the land had rest for 40 years. Because a woman stood up, because she led, because she followed Barak into battle when he wouldn't go out on his own, because she stood when no one else would stand, now the land was going to have 40 years of peace. Amen? And you know what? Because Jesus left heaven and came to earth and went to the cross and suffered and died that we might have eternal life, you and I can know the Prince of Peace and we can walk in peace every single day. Can we say amen to that? So walking in victory, by willingly responding to God's calling upon your life, don't be con uh, um, Content sitting on the sideline. As you remember, remember all that God has done for you by remembering who you were before you came to the Lord. It's a great reminder for us of the grace of God. By boldly proclaiming what the Lord has done, share it with others. By walking in faithful and fearless obedience in the face of the enemy. Guys, let's not be fearful. Let's trust God. By putting the flesh to death, I got to put myself to death daily. By not fa uh, falling for the false hope that the things of this world want you to trust in. And then by entering into his rest. All I have to say is, the Bible rocks. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you, we love you, Lord.
You are indeed a great and an awesome God. And I thank you that these events that took place thousands of years ago have such clear application to our lives tonight. Help us, Lord, to walk in victory. Help us, Lord, to be people who are unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to use the gifts you've given us. Help us, Lord, to love you more than anything else and make you the priority and passion of our life. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Is he worthy to be worshipped? Let's worship.